Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Seymour, and this is Chapter 8 from your textbook on campaigns and elections. In this chapter, you will learn what is unique and what is not about American elections, reflect on how democratic American elections are today, examine the influence of money in elections, explore presidential and congressional campaigns, identify the keys to a successful campaign for Congress, and consider election reforms. The time, place, and manner of elections in the United States, especially federal elections, is uh, in a constitutional clause that delegates control of those elections to state governments. We have in the United States frequent and fixed elections. We have more elections more often than other modern democracies do. In a parliamentary democracy, there's a five-year ceiling on how long a government can go before calling an election, which allows for politicians to shape political conditions for their advantage. In the United States, we have fixed elections every two years for Congress, uh, for, for um, the House of Representatives, every four years for president, every six years for uh, the Senate and those uh, six year terms are staggered. So a third of the Senate is up every two years for election. There are over 520,000 elected officials in the United States, everything from presidents to municipal drain inspectors and 39 states elect judges, including the state of Texas. We elect our judges at the state level. Federal judges are appointed. So we need, we need to consider what the barriers are to voting and if there should be barriers to voting. And this is something that's coming up lately as a big issue. Um, we have registration requirements. Each state sets their own registration requirements. Eight states strictly require a photo ID. And again, Texas is at the lead of that one as well. Many states make registration very burdensome. Texas is at the lead of that one, especially after the most recent state election laws that were just passed and took place in September. Um, some states make it very easy. California, for instance, that these states have same day registrations, vote by mail or vote early. These states will send out not the ballots, but the mail in applications at the very least to get the ballot and they make it easy for mail-in voting. Texas has decided that because we are a Republican controlled state that we want to have it to make it more difficult for things like mail-in voting because Republicans seem to believe that mail-in voting has the potential for fraud. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of proof to that effect. The majority party protects itself by adjusting the voting rules. So in Texas, that would be the Republicans. In the United States, that was the Republicans. In the Senate um, and in Congress, the, the, um, the margin between Republican and Democratic control is so thin that Republicans have tried to make it harder to vote and Democrats have tried to make it easier to vote, but it has become a partisan action. Another issue that has come up is the issue of fan financing campaigns, campaign finance. Is this become the new inequality, the rich versus the poor? Is there too much money in comp campaign financing? The price tag for the 2016 presidential and congressional races was around $6.5 billion, all added together. But by 2020, this had doubled to a cost of $13 billion. And a majority of that is in down ballot races, especially for Congress. Public officials devote enormous amounts of time and energy to raising money for campaigning. Free speech clauses, especially the First Amendment, which have been recognized by the Supreme Court, protect groups who wish to support candidates or causes. The Supreme Court struck down limits on total donations to things like super PACs. Now, a political action committee, which we'll talk about, and a super PAC are two very different things because a political action committee can be directly related to the candidate. 
a super PAC is not related to the candidate, has to be separate. So this is the cost of presidential campaigns as they've gone just in the last 20 years. From 2000, it was uh, $3.08 billion in the presidential year and $2.18 billion in the, um, the next congressional year, the, the midterm. But by the time you get to 2018, it was $6.5 billion in 2016, $5.19 in 2018. And look at the number. Look at the number for... Um, 2020, $13.9 billion. So have we become a democracy for the rich? Some groups, many groups, most groups continue main, contribute mainly to one party. For instance, labor unions have in the past backed Democrats, but labor unions this past election in 2016 tended to back Republicans, and that was a big difference in money, and that gave Donald Trump a lot of advantage, especially in those down-ballot elections. The oil and natural gas companies have always supported Republicans because Republicans tend to take less environmental stances against oil and gas companies than do Democrats. Most businesses will split their donations between the two parties because they don't want to show partisanship. Incumbents generally overwhelm their challengers in federal elections in the United States. Sitting senators amassed $9.9 million in 2018, while opponents raised $761,000. But re-election rates in 2016 for the House were 96% and for the Senate, 93%. So if you have the incumbency advantage, if you have already been elected to the office and you're running again, you have a huge advantage, especially in terms of collecting money, because you already have the job and they know that you will probably get re-elected. And so a lot of these special interests are going to try to persuade you to vote their way. And that means money. So the need to raise funds makes office holders very sensitive to those who fund them. So are they more sensitive to us as voters or potential voters, or are they more sensitive to those that give them lots and lots of money? You can pretty much make up your mind on that one, but I can tell you they're very sensitive, very sensitive to those that give them money. Campaign money does not seem to matter in your higher profile races, but down ballot races. So, for instance, it doesn't matter as much for the presidency, but those down ballot races, if the president is going to become a Republican, is a Republican, then for the most part, you're going to see those down ballot races matter, especially in the next election. So um, it matters when you're looking at those that are riding your coattails. Another thing is that for major donors, it's much easier to give. Uh, political action committees or PACs are organizations of at least 50 people who are affiliated with an interest group that is permitted to make contributions to a candidate for federal office, and they can legally contribute up to $10,000 to any one candidate. So these guys are have more of a connection to the candidate, but they'll call themselves Citizens for Concerned Immigration or Citizens... Uh, for a new environment or whatever, and they'll try to persuade you that they're, they're really all about a special interest uh, policy issue when really they are supporting or working against a candidate. And a political action committee can spend their money against a candidate just as much or more than they can spend the money f their money for a candidate. Super PACs. This is where the Citizens United ruling has really come in important which was, it's 10 years old now. The organizations that raise and spend unlimited amounts of money to promote a candidate or publicize a cause are super PACs. However, they may not directly contribute to a candidate or coordinate with a campaign. So what they do is they run media. They'll run media in support of a candidate, but they don't give to that candidate. And so your super PACs can spend as much money as they want to for or against a candidate. Um, and so these were developed after.
after the 2010 Citizens United versus the Federal Election Committee ruling by the Supreme Court that basically said that organizations vote and speak with their money, that an organization speaks with its money, and to have free speech, it must be able to spend an unlimited amount. And that's where super PACs come. Now, another form of fundraising is bundling. This is a form of fundraising where an individual persuades others to donate large amounts that are then delivered together to a candidate or campaign. And this is a loophole to campaign contribution limits because what they do is they get all these different organizations to contribute together and then they give them a big bundle of money. 527 groups are organizations that raise and spend unlimited amounts for issue advocacy, but are forbidden to coordinate with any candidate candidate or campaign, and they are forbidden from advocating directly on behalf of a candidate's election. They can contribute and spend an unlimited amount to issue advocacy, but they may not explicitly ex uh, support or oppose a candidate. So they do it in very strange ways. They'll, they'll come up with these campaigns that are um, basically trying to say, oh, uh, Donald Trump is is bad for the environment, so Donald Trump is a bad candidate. Or uh, uh, Joe Biden, Sleepy Joe, is not good for business, and so he's going to hurt you in the long run. And so basically they make it appear as though they're advocating a specific issue, but in reality they're advocating for a candidate. So it's hidden. So who runs for president? Well, for one thing, experienced politicians tend to run for president. Senators, vice presidents, and governors tend to run for president, but Donald Trump was something rather new. He was a newcomer. He had never held elective office, nor had he ever run for an elective office, ever. He ran on his reputation as a business leader and a man of the people, even though he's supposed to be a multi-billionaire. So, man of the people if he's running for billionaires. Populism, though, is where you're running as a man of the people, so you want to appear as though you represent the common man. That's populism. And we have seen populism grow uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, and that's one of the reasons that Donald Trump was able to get elected in 2016. There are three phases of a presidential election. Number one, you have to win the nomination. So you have the invisible primary. That's the primary to get money to build your organization, to compete in debates, to get yourself recognized, to scramble for media attention. As an example, Donald Trump going down the escalator or um, uh, back in 2016 or 2015, or uh, for an example, uh, Joe Biden standing, uh, standing there saying, I have come to a point where it has come clear to me that I must run because I do not agree with the policies of Donald Trump. Uh, then you have to run for your caucuses. Your Iowa caucus and New Hampshire primaries are your first two general caucus elections. A caucus is a local meeting of voters to select candidates to represent a political party in a general election or to choose delegates who select candidates at a convention. A caucus basically is a very democratic process and it goes down to the people. These are literally, you stand on one side of the room or another in support of your candidate or you raise your hand in support of your candidate. Closed primaries are when a vote is cast by party members to select candidates who represent the par their party in a general election, but you must declare your party, register as a Democrat or a Republican prior to the actual primary. And an open primary is a vote that is cast by any eligible voter to select candidates to represent the party in the general election. Now, Super Tuesday is a date on the presidential primary calendar when a great number of states hold primaries and caucuses. And this has come up because so many states wanted to be the first. They wanted to get the attention and have more influence from the candidates be, uh, by getting in first. And so now a lot of them have joined together on this Super Tuesday because there's so many of them trying to come in first. Uh, the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire caucuses 
have uh, primaries have always been kind of held in esteem as first uh, for uh, elect, uh, for these candidates. And so that's still happening today. Now, state by state contests. We have a proportional system. Um, the allocation of votes or delegates are done on the basis of the percentage of the vote that is received. And con if this contrasts with the winner take all system, a winner take all system is when the candidate receives a simple majority or among uh, multiple candidates, a plurality, which basically means they got more than anybody else. These receive all electoral votes or primary delegates. Sometimes these are called first past the post. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Now, organizing, then do you have the convention itself? So they have to organize the convention and this presents the candidate to the public. The convention is very important. This last go around in 2020, you had conventions that took place remotely, which was really strange. Uh, electoral bounce is the spike in the polls that follows an event such as a party's national convention when you see the candidate start to get a little bit of a lift after because he's gotten attention. The general election is the sprint to November after the conventions with no pause and they basically work from convention time which is August September all the way up to November about three months. And they often feature two or three debates between the candidates and one vice presidential debate, which are usually uh, sponsored by the election, uh, by an independent election committee. Now, there are a number of factors that can contribute to or work against a candidate's ability to become elected, uh, especially for president. One of these is the economy. The United States economic outlook is considered the most important factor. Another is demographics. Um, for instance, the Republicans tend to attract more uh, uh, of a white demographic than uh, the Democrats who tend to be uh, attract more um, of a minority demographic. War and foreign policy. Um, if there is a an issue coming up between the United States and another country, oftentimes a presidential candidate will take advantage of that or they will say, I stand against uh, a conflict. Domestic issues. This is usually what sets the agenda for the presidency itself. It, it's, it's all about the domestic issues. Um, so the president's going to set out an agenda and say, this is what I stand for. Now, whether or not they're gonna get any of it accomplished is a whole other thing. And we're looking at that right now with Joe Biden. Is he going to be a consequential president? It's beginning to look like not, and it's not necessarily his fault, but this is what happens when you set an agenda, but that agenda doesn't necessarily work in a polarized uh, political environment. The campaign organization itself, Trump, had an incredible campaign organization, and that's one of the reasons he won in 2016. Another thing is that parties matter, political parties matter. And this is more now than any other time that I can think of in, in American history. Your party partisanship matters. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it matters now. The Electoral College and your swing states. Does a candidate focus only on those swing states? Or does the candidate focus on what would be called a flyover state, which would be a state whose uh, electoral college vote doesn't really matter as much? Trump tended to focus on those flyover states and kind of gambled and won in 2016 on the gamble that he could get enough of them together to form a coalition that would get him reelected. And, and it did barely um, or to get him elected. I'm sorry. So then there is that elusive winning recipe of all of these put together. And, you know, if anybody could market what works and what doesn't, boy, that would be something. But right now we have a lot of data and that data is becoming more and more solid on what does work and what doesn't. So can we really come up with that winning, elusive winning recipe? Um, this is kind of a weird map 
that was put together in your book and it shows in skewed influences each state and how much it mattered as far as its electoral college votes and you can see that Florida mattered an awful lot North Carolina mattered um, Texas mat see Texas mattered an awful lot but up here in the north uh, it, uh, these traditional flyover states really mattered uh, again political candidate preference by race or ethnicity uh, Democrats tend to be uh, preferred by black and Hispanic voters and uh, Republicans tend to be preferred by white voters and that gra that gap has been growing predicting a presidential election there are parts of the prediction model <coughs> that have to be put together including the economy whether the country is at peace or war the presidential approval ratings of a president running for re-election fatigue with the party in power you may see this happening coming up in 2022 um, there usually is a bounce that the opposite party gets and there's there's a we're going to see whether or not the Democrats can hold it together against the Republicans in 2022 or whether they will lose and and history would tell us they will probably lose seats and if they do then they will lose control of congress and that's going to be a big issue uh trouble dealing with the difficulty of the electoral college right now it's so complex and none of us most of us do not understand how the electoral college works we don't understand that we're not really voting for president we're voting on an elector for president the prediction models are useful tools but they are not always accurate for instance, coming up to the 2016 elections, it was there was no doubt in any pollster's mind that Hillary Clinton was going to win, but she didn't. So who runs for Congress? Well, the requirements to run for Congress are that you have to be 25 years of age for the House or 30 years of age for the Senate, that you needed to have seven years of U.S. citizenship for the House or nine years of U.S. citizenship for the Senate, and that you must live in the state that you're going to represent. Or have a residence there for instance Hillary Clinton when she ran for senator in New York um, she was in Washington DC with her husband but she ran um, she had to establish a household in New York and she did uh, so money winning the house seat costs about 1.7 million dollars in campaign contributions to mount a successful campaign winning a Senate seat costs an average of ten and a half million dollars in campaign contributions to mount a successful campaign despite the wealth needs relatively few business leaders or celebrities in the United States have run for Congress and those who have run lose I can only think of on, on uh, my hand of uh, the number of um, celebrities that have won for Congress um, Sonny Bono being probably the most prominent of those uh, money alone rarely swings congressional elections but big money makes it hard to challenge an incumbent and this is the issue is that if you you know if the incumbent can get enough contributions to keep him in office the fact that 96 to 98 percent of congressional and senate uh, uh, incumbents are re-elected works in their favor and then connections if they have a relative or a spouse in congress a previous seat in a state level government close to half of non-incumbents in the Senate were political veterans um, you have to really have some experience at running for office and again Donald Trump was an anomaly in terms of running for president but he would have had a bigger chance of running for president much bigger than he would have had for running for Congress again I cannot I cannot stress enough the power of incumbency um, Incumbency advantage is the tendency for members of Congress to win re-election in overwhelming numbers. Incumbents war, more, win or won more than 90% of the races, and that's been happening every, every time. Members have become skilled at running against Congress. They fight for dysfunctional institution, which is called Fenno's paradox. Um, so what happens is, uh, is that 
this paradox is that people despise Congress, but they tend to defend their own representatives. So what will happen is I will support my representative here in El Paso, but I will I will tend not to support a representative or think that a representative has done well in another district. OK. So this is re-election rates, and you can see that for the most part, um, you have the House on top, the Senate on the bottom. For the most, for the most part, um, especially in the last 20 or 30 years, it's 90 to 96 percent re-election rate, and uh, for Senate, it's been even higher, 90 to 95 percent. So patterns in congressional elections. In midterm elections, the national elections that are held between presidential elections, these involve all the seats in the House of Representatives and one third of those in the Senate and 36 governorships and other positions. And uh, midterm loss is a president's party losing congressional seats during the midterm elections. This has occurred in most midterm elections. So we would expect that the Democratic Party will lose seats in Congress and that could be a very big issue. Uh, opposition party usually wins congressional seats in wartime, and this has also been historically proven to be true. So gerrymandering is the intentional redrawing of the lines by one party to give its to give its candidates an advantage in the in the upcoming elections, and this happens. You have reapportionment happening every ten years based on the census. And we are getting to a reapportioning year this year. Reapportionment is the reorganization of the boundaries of the House districts, and it is a process that follows the results of the U.S. Census taken every 10 years. So the census was in 2020, so this will be 2021. You'll have redistricting coming up in the fall uh, or in the spring, 2021-22. District lines are redrawn to ensure rough equality in the number of constituents that are represented by each House member. And a gerrymander is when that why those lines are redrawn uh, in such a way that it gives the advantage to one party over another. So gerrymander, most of the the uh, congressional lines are 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 uh, drawn so that more Republicans will get congressional seats in Texas than will Democrats. So if you have um, if you have say a group, let's say in San Antonio or El Paso. We tend to have Democratic representatives, but what they'll do, is especially, um, is try to redraw the lines so that you'll have more of a chance to get a Republican in, in office. So a packing is people uh, putting like-minded voters into one district, which is a way of giving the advantage to one party over another. Cracking is breaking up uh, the voters so that they don't have as much influence. So you're going to see a lot of packing in Central Texas and a lot of cracking happening here in West Texas in El Paso. Uh, a safe district is when voters tend to historically vote for a certain party. So in your safe districts, for instance, in Dallas, uh, while voters in the city of Dallas tend to vote Democratic, voters out in those areas in DFW uh, tend to vote Republican and you get safe districts. Non, uh, El Paso has a safe district for Democrats, for instance. Um, Nonpartisan district and minority representation. Um, minority representation is very hard because of this gerrymandering problem. What's going to happen is you're going to see cracking trying to break up uh, voting, voting groups, and a lot of those are minorities, or packing in order to get uh, more influence to, for instance, white voters than black and Hispanic, or more influence to black and Hispanic voters than to white. So this is what happens in a in a um, scenario of gerrymandering. In in the case of they called it policy land, policy land in your book. You have two districts that are 100% Republican and one district is 100% Democrat. Policy land sends two Republicans and one Democrat to Congress. After the redistricting, all three districts have a Republican majority of 66.6% .6 
and poli sci land sends three Republicans to Congress and no Democrats. Because what they've done is cracked the Democratic voters and packed the Republican voters into each of the districts. And it is legal to do this. So how do you run for Congress? Key one, money. Um, you get lots of potential donors and you call on a list for the candidates to call to make the request to give them money or to support them through PACs and, and super PACs. You run for an open seat without an incumbent, because remember the incumbent's gonna have a 95 to 96% advantage. Due to the death or retirement of a candidate of, of a an incumbent to have better chance for spending money effectively and you're going to see more money spent on those elections key number two have a good organization have connections with talented staff like speech writers fundraisers get out the vote experts or go tvs volunteer coordinators and so forth you've got to have a good on the ground organization without a good organization political insiders do not consider the campaign winnable and they will shy away from encouraging donations to that campaign and they will send their money somewhere else. Candidate centered elections are those in the system in which individual candidates decide to run, raise their own money and design their own strategy as opposed to a party system in which political parties play those roles. You can't have candidate funded elections. It's very rare now. Strategy, building a coalition of supporters and connecting with influential leaders of a particular constituency. Connecting with voters through the media with high profile events and with paid advertisement to raise name recognition. And name recognition is important. It's an advantage that is possessed by a well known political figure or a political celebrity. For instance, Matthew Conaghy says that he's going to potentially run for governor in the state. A, 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 we haven't had a statewide elected um, candidate for statewide office since the 1990s and I uh, but he's going to run on his name Beto says he's going to run as a republic uh, as a democrat in uh, the next election and he's going to you know he has a name but he also has a reputation negative campaigning is when you're running for office by attacking the opponent messaging proving or providing a reason for voters to vote for you Trump did this beautifully by this, I'm going to build a wall and then Mexi and, and Mexico is going to pay for it. It was a perfect campaign. First time wins can happen by accident, but re-elections need a reason for voters to vote. And we saw that again in, in Trump and some of his, uh, uh, some of those that hung on to his coattails. Gerrymandering is, uh, uh, how, how can we fix American elections? First, to fix gerrymandering, you need a neutral panel to draw the lines so that the, the party in charge is not drawing the lines. Good luck with that. Money. Prohibiting anonymous donations and publicly financed elections. Financing the election at taxpayer expense instead of having, um, having candidates bring in their own money. Good luck with that. Term limits. Uh, limiting the number of times that a candidate can run would also be uh, something that would stop incumbency. And by doing that, it opens up uh, elections. 